Hi, everyone. Welcome to our State of the Science Snapshot from the Science and Technology team at the Good Food Institute. I'm Liz Specht, VP of Science and Technology, and I'll be joined by several of my colleagues to highlight the most exciting developments happening in the science and technology ecosystem for alternative proteins. These snapshots are presented three times a year, and each will cover developments over the prior four-month period. This field, of course, is moving too quickly to cover all the advances in a comprehensive way in one short video. So these snapshots are really intended to serve as kind of a highlight reel curated by our subject matter experts and team leaders. Before we dive in, I just wanted to set the stage uh, for, for this snapshot with a bit of context about this particular moment in history and its relevance to the anticipated future rate of progress in the alternative protein field. One major signaling event from just the last couple of weeks provides a really nice example of the type of development that could really start to spur accelerated innovation in the alt protein sector. Just last month, President Joe Biden signed an executive order to support the administration's goals to bolster biotechnology R&D, foster an ecosystem that advances biotech, and, quote, boost sustainable biomass production and create climate smart incentives for American agricultural producers. So among other obligations, this order asked the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, to prepare a report that's assessing how to use biotechnology and biomanufacturing for food and agriculture innovation, including by, quote, cultivating alternative food sources. Uh, the report needs to identify high priority R&D needs, as well as public-private partnership opportunities. And then the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy will then develop an implementation plan based on that input in the report. In the briefing that announced this executive order, a senior White House official explicitly said the order is intended to, quote, improve food security and drive ag agricultural innovation, including through foods made with cultured animal cells. So it was great to see a direct shout out to cultivated meat there. The significance of this event really can't be overstated. This is the first major action by the president and the White House to advance alternative proteins. And this will really kick off a major initiative within the Department of Agriculture. It signals an intent to keep the United States competitive with other countries that have invested significantly in biotech and could really mark a sea change in the level of interest and investment in alt protein development in the US. And of course, it's worth noting that the US currently accounts, um, or excuse me, currently outspends all other countries on total R&D funding, accounting for over a quarter of the world's R&D budget. So this move could really have massive implications and ripple effects at home and abroad. So with that as just one timely indicator of the sort of broader context in which the alternative protein sector is coming of age, I'm excited to hand over to first to my colleagues, Aaron Rees Clayton and Amy Huang to talk about advances in the alternative protein scientific ecosystem, including noteworthy funding announcements and updates regarding the growth of the talent streams leading into this field. As probably many of you know, funding and talent considerations are two of the big old, biggest bottlenecks for growth in this field. Then we'll turn our turn over to our technical subject matter experts, including Drs. Priera Pranescu, Adam Lehman, Elliot Schwartz, and Claire Baumkamp, to talk about what has caught their eye over the last few months in terms of new research successes and noteworthy publications in each of their zones of expertise. I'd also like to give a shout out to my colleague, Renee Bell, who's advancing the slides for us and who helped organize and manage all of this information to make each of these snapshots possible. So with that, I'll hand over to Erin. Thank you, Liz. On June 3rd, GFI closed applications for our 2022 Research Grant Program Request for Proposals, or RFP. We were delighted that we received 195 applications from 26 countries around the world. 17 of those proposals came from universities with alt protein project chapters, indicating the value of our scientific ecosystem building efforts to generate researcher awareness and engagement. 46 of the 195 applications, approximately 24%, were invited to submit phase two applications. 
We'll introduce you to our newest cohort of GFI grantees in our next State of the Science update at the end of the year. The tremendous response we received to our RFP demonstrates the global research community's hearty appetite for research funding to conduct alternative protein research. A total of $32.5 million was requested in research funding, which is eight times more than the research funding GFI had available for our 2022 RFP. Thankfully, we are beginning to see other funders stepping up to feed the demand for all protein research funding. On June 29th, Israel's Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology, along with the Ministry of Agriculture and GFI Israel, released a call for alternative protein research that will fund 14 research projects over two years, amounting to a little over $1 million uh, in US dollars total in funding. The next day on June 30th, a California budget bill was signed that will direct $5 million over the next year to advance alternative protein research at three University of California campuses. This is the largest single investment in alternative protein R&D of any US state and the first ever state investment in cultivated meat research. And on August 30th, Israel-based cultivated meat startup Ela Farms announced they would be leading a $40 million innovation sprint in cellular agriculture R&D over the next five years in collaboration with several investor groups. Their recognition as an innovation sprint partner of the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, or AIM for Climate, signals acknowledgement of Cell Ag as one solution to climate and food security issues. While this non-dilutive research funding activity from nonprofits, government agencies, companies, and investors is encouraging, it is still only a fraction of what is needed. GFI will continue to collaborate with partners around the world to mobilize additional alternative protein research funding. I'll now turn it over to Amy to provide talent and training ecosystem updates. Thank you so much, Erin. One of the many exciting threads we've been following is the rise of educational materials and flexible online course offerings that continue to make alternative protein education more accessible to communities around the globe. Over the past four months, a few of these notable highlights include a comprehensive new textbook on next generation plant-based foods published by GFI grantees, professors David Julian McClements and Lutz Grossman. Um, this textbook provides a review of ingredients, processing operations, nutrition, quality attributes, and specific plant-based food categories, such as milk and dairy products, egg products, meat, and seafood products. And we also see Australia's first online course on cellular agriculture coming online, um, created by Cellular Agriculture Australia, as well as the world's first Chinese language MOOC that covers alternative protein science and innovation created by GFI Consultancy. Alongside these top of the funnel introductory level courses, we're also beginning to see deeper dives that will equip future scientists and engineers with the know-how to advance the state of alternative protein R&D. One such example is the new lecture on the science of plant proteins that we've just added to GFI's free online MOOC. And as a companion to what has been a super promising wave of growth in virtual flexible learning options, we've continued to see formal educational pathways emerge where students of all career stages can begin to earn degree credit in their studies on alternative proteins. Courses at institutions like Unicamp, Stanford, and Hebrew University have wrapped in the last four months, and their students have already applied their knowledge to the field in impactful and meaningful ways via capstone projects, research proposals, and internships. And we're very excited to continue to follow the impact of some of the courses that have newly launched or are on the horizon, like the Johns Hopkins course on future food manufacturing, started by the Johns Hopkins Alt Protein Project, the Telhai course on alternative protein food science, the University of British Columbia course on novel plants and cell-based foods, and the University of Beirut's course on alternative proteins, policies, and regulation. So while this growth in universities uh, supporting alternative protein education is very encouraging, it is still only a small trickle of what's needed to truly train the alternative protein workforce. 
GFI will be continuing to collaborate with colleges, universities, and other key innovators and stakeholders to create more and more of these essential alternative protein training programs, and we encourage any interested partners to reach out. Another trend we've been detecting is the growth of faculty titles, appointments, and openings that codify alternative proteins as a new research field. Some relevant data points to support this trend include Dr. Reza Avisapur's recent title change as the Assistant Professor of Food Safety and Cellular Agriculture at Virginia Tech, Dr. Marius Henkel's new appointment as the Chair of Cellular Agriculture at the Technical University of Munich, and the University of Helsinki's open role for a tenure track professor in cellular agriculture. All of these signals provide important indicators that academic institutions are beginning to recognize alternative proteins as a truly new research field and worthy of the same type of resource allocation. Lastly, in August, GFI was thrilled to train and welcome 20 new student groups into the Alt Protein Project. These groups are led by brilliant student leaders that hail from research universities around the globe and include our first groups from Asia, Africa, and Australia. We're so delighted to have these new voices and perspectives to advocate for alternative protein research and education in our quest to build a better food system. And all in all, this brings our total number of groups in the Alt Protein Project to 36 chapters across 17 countries and five continents. And I hope in the coming months and years, you'll join me in following their journeys as they mobilize their communities to usher in a new era for our food system. So with that, I'll pass it over to Pri for exciting developments in the science of plant-based proteins. Thank you so much, Amy, for providing those excellent opportunities and advancements. Um, strategic partnerships across industry, academia, and other organizations are strong enablers of the scientific advancements we see in plant-based food innovations. I'd like to note a few exciting strong collaborations announced this last cycle. Jividon, Bueller, and Cargill are jointly opening a tropical food innovation lab in Camp. Campinos, Brazil, on the Food Technology Institute's premises. The lab is slated to open early 2023 and will be approximately 1,000 square feet. This collaborative lab will explore Brazil's rich plant biodiversity and include wet and dry alternative protein extrusion systems. This innovative lab announcement follows another collaboration with Jibidon and Bueller with the opening of their plant innovation center in Singapore last year. Additionally, Waters Corporation, a leading analytical instrumentation company, partnered with the Plant Protein Innovation Center, or PPIC, to provide technical technology and expertise to advance our understanding of plant-derived amino acids and drive development of new protein sources. This figure just depicts a typical oil seed fractionation process and is outlined here. Raw material such as a seed is dehulled, milled, and then subjected to a number of wet fractionation steps to separate protein, oil, and carbohydrate fractions. Recently, modifications to, to traditional processes like these have been made to enhance plant protein functionality, reduce extraction costs, and improve environmental sustainability. Examples of these first focus on soybeans. ADM and Benson Hill announced a partnership in which ingredient company ADM will scale up breeding company Benson Hill's ultra high protein soybeans to produce soy protein ingredients at scale with products expected to launch in early 2023. This announcement follows another announcement earlier this year that Benson Hill and Kellogg plan to partner for their ultra high protein soy ingredient to be used in plant-based Morningstar products. Ultra high protein soybean is per, are preferred for plant-based meats as the protein ingredient as it's easier to extract and requires less processing overall to retain a better quality protein. Next advances in pea protein continue with Equinom creating a 75% protein content minimally processed pea protein ingredient. And this lack of chemical processing needed in Equinom's process may yield more functional protein ingredient overall. Merit also announced a pea ingredient, Pizzazz C, that is a ready to drink protein um, 
protein that can be used in beverages and reduces sedimentation and grittiness. Merritt also claims that pizzazz with transglutaminase has a good binding and gelling properties and can replace methyl cellulose. More novel ingredients like sunflower are also being optimized. With Aparo making an upcycled sunflower protein isolate, Aparo is the same company whose tech is now being deployed in AB and Bev on a commercial scale to extract highly functional barley protein from brewer's spent grain. So this is very promising sunflower ingredient. Burkhan Nutriscience co-investment with Protein Ingredient Industries Canada is also developing an upcycled protein isolate from sunflower seeds. And in both of these approaches, uh, cold press is used rather than a traditional defatting step to remove oil from sunflower seeds prior to protein extraction. And cold pressing is less effective to remove oil, but it does provide a higher value of protein ingredient with better properties than uh, with traditional extraction steps. Finally, Roquette announced its plans to launch a rice protein isolate and concentrate that adds to their um, current organic pea and fava bean protein lines. Dry fractionation methods have emerged as less energy intensive processes to create protein concentrates. Because the solvent free dry methods pr subject proteins and other crop ingredients to less harsh conditions, ingredients can better retain their original properties and functionalities compared to traditional wet fractionation methods. Milling and air classification are depicted here, and there are good examples of dry fractionation methods where air classification separates particles based off of their aerodynamic properties, therefore separating a protein-rich fine fraction from a starch-rich coarse fraction. This cycle, open access papers that pu were published that demonstrate the promise of dry fractionation methods for hemp, mung bean, yellow pea, and cow pea flour proteins. Here we see these papers where researchers from University of Guelph in Canada and Aarhus in a university in Denmark, including GFI grantee Professor Mario Martinez, evaluated dry fractionated hemp protein concentrates compared to their wet fractionated counterparts. Despite their lower protein content, extruded hemp protein concentrates enriched through dry fractionation were highly fibrous and, create, and demonstrated less hardness and, and dark color than their wet fractionated counterparts. Um, the authors did note that there is definitely room for optimization where the dry fractionated the hemp extruded did contain high levels of anti-nutrients. Researchers from Wageningen University and research, including GFI grantee and first author PhD candidate Meek Schlangen, explored the water holding capacity, gelation, and rheological processes, properties of mung bean, pea protein, and cow pea flour as well. Lastly, a number of comprehensive reviews with more focus on relevant technology um, for plant-based meats were published this last cycle. Open access reviews and original research help educate other researchers and, public, and the public about plant-based food research and build the foundational knowledge in the field. So for example, researchers from University of Massachusetts Amherst published an open access review that dives into 3D printing technologies. Researchers from University of Helsinki published an open access review on flavors and extruded plant-based meat alternatives. Researchers from University of College Cork um, reviewed general protein trends and gave recommendations on targeted formulation for plant-based foods. And finally, researchers from CSIRO published an open access review that overviews the landscape of public domain scientific literature and uh, patent landscape, including the identification and analysis of 918 patents focused on plant-based meat texture, flavor, appearance, cooking behaviors, and end product manufacturing. And with that, I would love to turn it over to Adam, who will review the latest developments in fermentation-derived protein technology. Thank you. Thanks, Pri. First, I'd like to focus on an exciting development in alternative fat fermentation. Why the recent research into fermentation-derived fats? Well, microbes make fats and oils, generally called lipids, but currently these lipids aren't made in the right shapes, lengths, or quantities to make them viable for commercial food products. Human milk fat is primarily composed of a fat called triacylglycerol, or TAG, with distinct chemical bond orientations called stereoisomerisms in chemistry that assist with absorption in the human digestive tract, especially infants. Oleaginous, or lipid-storing yeast, are a promising source of alternative fats, though like plants, most species do not make tag in the same shape as that that is found in human milk. 
a team of researchers here and on this paper uh, engineered the generally regarded as safe lipid storing yeast Yaroia lipolytica to produce human milk-like tag by introducing an acyl transferase enzyme, which you can see here in this figure with the green arrow, into the glycerol lipid biosynthetic pathway of the Yaroia yeast. This increased the percentage of total tag with the correct orientation, the human milk-like orientation, from 1% to over 60%. This would make these fermentation-derived fats more readily absorbed in the human gut. The authors also compared TAG composition from fermentations fed by different carbon sources, such as glucose, glycerol, palm oil, or mixtures thereof. And they found significant fatty acid composition differences between these sources, demonstrating the ability to tune fatty acid synthesis by both genetic engineering and feedstock substrate selection. We expect alternative fat researchers will continue to build on these themes by using tunable parameters to precisely tailor lipid production, both in quantity and type. Making more fats that are chemically identi identical to human milk fats will allow fermentation-derived products to deliver better nutrition to infants. Another emerging area of focus we expect to grow relates to culturing microbial consortia, or mixtures of different microbe species in order to produce unique or novel metabolites that they do not usually make when they're grown in an anexic culture, meaning a pure monoculture that contains just one species. In this study, authors co-cultured a lipid storing fungi, Mucor pumbleus, and a bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, and evaluated effects on lipid productivity. Again, if microbes could make more lipids in the most nutritious, well-digested, and flavorful forms, fermentation-derived fats can replace fats and oils from a variety of sources. Through environmental sensing and signaling interactions, co-culturing fungi and bacteria may activate silent gene clusters that change the proliferation and biochemistry of the microbes. In this study, co-culturing led to a significant increase in the yield of fungal biomass, lipids, and total fatty acids. Taking a look at the biomass dried from these cultures, we can already see that the co-culture produced different textures and colors in the biomass, and the authors compared their composition. Of note, they found that the co-cultured fungus produced twofold higher gamma linolenic acid, which is an essential omega-6 fatty acid found primarily in seed oils. Decanoic acid, a fatty acid found in coconut and palm kernel oil, as well as in milk fat, was also produced in the consortium, but was not detected in the monoculture. While these two are a model system for research use only, co-culturing represents a promising strategy to unlock the full potential of microbes, as it often better represents their natural environment, which in turn can induce production of high value fats, proteins, and other food ingredients. Turning back to protein, in the precision fermentation space, we saw an exciting development regarding commercial scale readiness of an additional high value functional product. As we've seen with globin proteins, metal binding proteins are an attractive target for precision fermentation. Lactoferrin is a relatively large protein that can bind two metal ions per protein molecule, and we're still learning about its roles in, in human health and nutrition. Lactoferrin is an important bioactive protein found in milk, especially in human colostrum. A recent review highlighted the importance of lactoferrin as a cell cycle modulator and as a sensor in DNA repair on top of its known functions in immune regulation and facilitating iron absorption. The startup Turtle Tree recently announced they're trending towards a 2023 commercial launch of their bovine lactoferrin produced via precision fermentation, an industry first. Initially, they'll be targeting the adult nutrition market in the US and Singapore, followed by formulations for the infant nutrition market. And to wrap up our fermentation snapshot, We'd like to conclude with an exciting analysis that was published demonstrating the environmental benefits of replacing beef with microbial protein produced by sugar-fed microbes. We all know that protein demand is expected to increase substantially from the present to 2050. The authors found that by replacing just 20% of per capita beef consumption with microbial protein from sugar-fed fermentation, this would be sufficient to offset deforestation and related land use change emissions by 50% in 2050. That's a great return on investment. The graphs on the left here show the change in land area use from now to 2050 in a scenario where 0% or 20% of the protein consumed is fermentation derived. You can see that the amount of deforestation, the dark green area below the x-axis, 
is reduced by about half in the case of 20% protein substitution. The results of this model show that less forest is destroyed, cropland expansion, expansion remains similar, and importantly, pasture land is actually reduced by 2050. On the right is a model of how land use related carbon dioxide emissions, which are strongly driven by the conversion of forest to agricultural lands, can be reduced over time as a result of substituting microbial protein. The authors predict these emissions will also be reduced by 50% as a result of 20% substitution. But even more enticing, models of 50% and 80% microbial protein substitution led to model reductions of 83 to 87% CO2 em emissions for protein production. Overall, this analysis is focused on the land use of microbial feedstock glucose versus animal feed crops and pastures all the way to the year 2050. Going forward, more aspects of fermented protein and animal protein processing and production will likely be compared by models such as these. This will allow more complete comparison of the environmental cost of animal and fermentation derived proteins. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Elliot for the latest developments in cultured meats. Thank you for those insights, Adam. So what is the environmental impact of cultivated meat production? A new study from researchers at the universities of Bath in the UK and Helsinki in Finland provided some new perspectives by assessing environmental impact based on laboratory data collected from a common mouse muscle cell line called C2C12, which was grown in hollow fiber bioreactors made of polystyrene. The study examined many different possible scenarios changing variables related to energy use, feedstock use, and waste handling to inform future bioprocess design decisions. In the graph shown here, you can see different environmental impact categories for two of the scenarios in the study. The cell culture medium, which is shown in green, is clearly the driver of all environmental impacts, which the authors explain is due to metabolic inefficiency of the C2C12 cells and the assumption that the amino acids would be sourced synthetically through industrial fermentation processes. In this figure, three of the cultivated meat scenarios are compared to conventional poultry and beef production shown in green and pink respectively. In this study, cultivated meat production has higher impacts than poultry, with some categories such as carbon footprint and land use being better than beef production, but others such as energy demand and eutrophication being higher than beef for some scenarios. Now it's important to note that these scenarios are not representative as optimized for commercial cultivated meat production. Rather, they can inform us on what needs to be prioritized for the industry to lower its environmental impact. Those key priorities include sourcing amino acids from plant hydrolysates and optimizing cell metabolism so less feedstock is needed. Additionally, the use of renewable energy at the production facility and throughout the supply chain will be important in achieving carbon footprints that approach or even undercut conventional poultry production. Perhaps the most important factor in the success of the cultivated meat industry will be cost. A team of researchers from UC Davis published a preprint study that looks at the techno-economics of commercial cultivated meat production. Previous studies looked at stirred tank bioreactors between 10,000 and 20,000 liters in size, but this study assumes stirred tank bioreactors could be much larger, 42,000 liters or 210,000 liters. The study also examines costs in a 260,000 liter airlift reactor, which mixes cells and liquids through aeration rather than a mechanical impeller. Other assumptions are taken mostly from previous studies, although the devil is often in the details, so it's encouraged to read the full study for the best interpretation of its conclusions. The key cost metrics can be found in the table on the left. The airlift reactor design is the most cost effective, with best case scenarios resulting in a cost of goods of around $13 per kilogram of cultivated beef. In general, airlift reactors have fewer moving parts and are thus cheaper to produce, saving on capital expenses compared to stirred tank reactors. The graph on the right shows what happens to production costs if cell culture media costs could be lowered. In this study, it's assumed that the media costs around $1 per liter, but other modeling has shown that it may be possible to lower this to even around 25 cents per liter. If this is accomplished, cultivated meat production costs could be closer to commodity conventional meats. Now it's important to note that animal cells have never been grown at such large scales, nor have they been grown in large airlift fire reactors before. So this work is best taken as conceptual. Nevertheless, the study illustrates that economies of scale and bioreactor design choice will play a large role in the ultimate cost of cultivated meat production. Scientists at Mosa Meat continued to open source the progress in the development of serum-free media. They've previously published papers on serum-free differentiation of bovine skeletal muscle, 
But in this paper, they examine how they achieve serum-free proliferation media outlined in the five steps below shown here. In short, the researchers replace some of the most important growth factors found in serum with chemically defined sources and then optimize their concentrations. The final formulation contained 15 total added factors and performed at about 97% efficiency compared to serum containing media. The media contains lots of recombinant proteins and other potentially expensive ingredients. So future work will be focused on low cost sourcing strategies for these ingredients. Lastly, several cultivated meat focused papers were published in the journal Biomaterials, including these three papers focused on microcarrier technology from labs in China, Norway, and the United States. The graphic outlines one paper that used microcarriers to grow both fat and muscle cells before combining them together in a 3D printed mold held together by the enzyme transglutaminase. The meatball prototypes shown here with the addition of red food coloring were cooked and analyzed for their texture and nutritional properties. Together, these studies demonstrate the potential in using various materials and methods for producing cultivated meat with microcarriers. I'll now turn it over to, to Claire who will review the latest developments in alternative seafood. All right, thanks Elliot. And with that, let's dive into the seafood updates. So an ongoing challenge for researchers investigating cultivated seafood, as I'm sure many of you know, is the lack of readily available cell lines from relevant species and cell types. A new paper from Dr. David Kaplan's lab at Tufts helps to address that challenge with an immortalized line from Atlantic mackerel mussel. Their new preprint describes the MAC1 line, which has been cultured for over 130 passages. From passages 37 through 43, the cells underwent a spontaneous immortalization crisis. And what this basically means is that most of the cells in the culture died, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing because the cells that survived this crisis appear to be a spontaneously immortalized cell line with a doubling time of around 24 hours. This is in contrast to around 64 hours for the original primary population. The myogenic potential of the line was confirmed by staining for the myoblast marker PAC7 and further confirmed by staining for myosin heavy chain after 10 days of serum starvation. The researchers also confirmed by PCR that the cells in culture indeed came from Atlantic mackerel, very important, and also importantly, species confirmation and testing of myogenic potential were carried out both before and after the crisis event. So this supports the idea that the cells surviving the crisis were indeed a true immortalized line and not some sort of contaminant. So there's a lot more data in the preprint if you're interested in diving into the details, but for the sake of time, I'll just give some quick takeaways. The most important, of course, is that a new cell line is available, and this is super exciting because it can help to lower the barrier to entry for new researchers wanting to solve all of the other problems that we have to deal with for cultivated fish without having to spend months and years troubleshooting cell isolation methods. Also, the finding that this ostensibly myogenic cell line can also take on an adipogenic-like phenotype and accumulate lipids is really interesting, and it could mean that we could have simpler and cheaper, cheaper bioprocesses for producing cultivated fish, so producing muscle and fat from the same cell line. The study also provides a roadmap for future cell line development efforts. One important lesson that uh, the research team shared with GFI uh, was that the process of sequentially screening isolation conditions substantially slowed down their research progress. So their recommendation for other researchers doing similar work is to actually screen multiple sets of conditions in parallel. So huge thank you to the team for sharing this with us, and we hope that others in the research community will benefit from this nugget of wisdom um, in their own cell and development efforts. And finally, the study produced validated primers for qPCR of several myogenesis and adipogenesis related genes from Atlantic mackerel, also validation of uh, the use of two commercially available antibodies in this species. Also related to cell line development, a new paper from Professor Per Bruheim's group uh, described the isolation of primary muscle cells from European lobster. The research team optimized conditions for mechanical and enzymatic dissociation of both adult muscle and larval tissue, isolated and quantified satellite cells, and then optimized culture conditions for the isolated satellite cell populations. This is the first published report of a primary muscle cell isolation from lobster, which provides a solid starting point for future studies of cultivated crustacean and for efforts to create immortalized lines. 
This paper also helps with the problem of a lack of validated antibodies for use in seafood species, as they reported the successful use of a commercially available PAC-7 antibody, but were not successful with either of the CD30 CD34 antibodies tested. I'm always super delighted to see papers reporting negative results like this, um, since this can save so, so much time for other researchers down the road. Um, they don't have to you know, waste time on doing the same experiments over and over again. So gold star for this research team um, and everyone else, please report your negative results. Another new paper from a team out of Belgium and the Netherlands described the screening of several species of microalgae as potential flavoring ingredients for plant-based seafood with comparison to macroalgae, also known as seaweed. The researchers used quantitative descriptive sensory analysis to compare eight species of microalgae for their fishy, mussel-like, and crab-like aroma and taste characteristics, as well as several other desirable and undesirable flavor characteristics. The team identified three microalgae species that seemed especially promising, and these outperformed the five species of macroalgae tested on many of the analyzed metrics. However, the researchers also detected grassy aroma and bitter taste in some of the uh, even the most promising microalgae species. So this could be an area that would require further optimization of growth conditions or processing conditions to remove. The past few months have also been a really exciting time when it comes to alternative seafood flavor. A systematic review on the volatile compounds important for seafood flavor identified compounds likely to be important for both general seafood-like aromas as well as species-specific aromas. There was also a newly published review discussing the challenges of getting the flavor just right in cultivated seafood products. At GFI, we were excited to receive some truly, truly excellent proposals in response to our April RFP, one of the priority topics of which was the creation of flavor components for alternative seafood. We've offered funding to several really promising teams, and we're urgent to share the details of those projects with you later this fall. And with that, I will turn it back over to Liz to close us out. Thanks so much, Claire. That wraps our State of the Science snapshot covering May through August of 2022. Again, these highlights represent just a curated collection of the most noteworthy developments in the field from our subject matter experts, not a comprehensive list of everything that's happening. If you'd like to stay up to date at a more detailed level throughout the year, get updates about all of our resources and publications by following us on social media and enrolling in our newsletters. If you'd like to visit a deeper dive on the science at any time, check out our detailed explainers, which link to tons of additional research papers and resources through our newly launched Alt Protein Literature Library. As a reminder, these snapshots and all of the insights, research, and resources that GFI offers are made possible by our donors. If you're interested in supporting more events like this and all of GFI's work to advance the alternative protein ecosystem, please contact philanthropy at gfi.org or visit gfi.org slash donate. Thanks again for tuning in.